Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to talk about Europe, we're going to talk about the wars, we're going to talk about the need of uh, uh, new uh, values for a peace movement. I'm with uh, Tony Robinson. And, and Tony, I am really sorry, I need to apologize because I don't know how what happened, but for the last seven years I do this show, 150 shows later, and you were not never been there. So here you are. Welcome to Face to Face, and sorry again for, uh, for it took me seven years to get to you. <laughs> Don't worry. I think I've been on the program before. I'm sure one yeah. time we spoke when I was in Ecuador, but that's like going back to 2016. I don't know oh, when, okay. when, when right. did you start Face to Face. Well, maybe I, did. I was like, how can this happen? <laughs> anyway, right. so we publish an article uh, with President Sarah, uh, I think last week, and you, you published actually an article you made on the statements of the need of a new uh, a new concept of a peace movement and also uh, the need to go over this both side issue. So, but before we go there, can you can you describe? Can you do a short bio of how did you become a humanist and how did you become? Uh, a peace activist, and, and we're going to see then you have been very involved in uh, nuclear disarmament and so on and so yeah. forth. Sure. I mean, my my process uh, goes back to 1989, 88, 89. Um, it was the time, I mean, we were still in the Cold War. The Berlin Wall uh, hadn't fallen yet. It was very much a time of uh, social issues, international issues being very much in the public consciousness. And it was the the whole topic of Nelson Mandela, uh, which really woke me up to the fact that there are terrible injustices uh, happening all over the world. And one thing led to another, and I discovered the, the humanist movement and in, in its expression, its political expression, the humanist party. And uh, I had the very good opportunity to go to the first ever Congress of the Humanist International in Florence in January 89. And there uh, I kind of met this incredible network of of idealists, utopian idealists, people who thought that the world could be a better place, a world without violence, um, a world with respect for human life, with equality, with a dignified standard of living for all human beings. And this was this was very much interesting to me. And one of the things that that Congress did was it adopted the UN Declaration of Human Rights as one of its uh, founding documents. And for me, that said okay well this is this is very interesting because the un declaration of human rights is one of the most progressive documents uh possibly the most progressive document of, uh, of the previous century and um and that was kind of my my entry into this world of idealism and also this world of activism because it became very clear to me um through the humanist uh, teaching that what was required was a simultaneous personal change, tackling the problems of violence that one experiences within one's own life, and also at the same time making efforts to transform society, uh, recognizing that there is a, a you know a symbiotic relationship between those two things. They don't happen in isolation. While you're changing the world, you're also changing yourself. When you're changing yourself, you're also making different choices in the world. And so those two things are related. And it became very clear for me that if, if we were going to make the world that I aspired to, then I was going to have to be a proactive part of that. And so I became an activist and I started uh, working with people in the UK in order to, to you know, develop groups an organizational structure uh, which al allowed us to coordinate our activities um, to create teams of, of of people whose people who are still my friends today um, developing themselves personally and also uh, working for for social change and then that you know that took me I mean I've been involved with that ever since you know I was 19 at university and then it was in the, in the year 2006. 
that the the founder of the humanist movement, um, Silo, he started to put a spotlight on the topic of nuclear weapons, and and it it made me realize that although I kind of thought that nuclear weapons were a thing of the past, because in 1990, 91, the Berlin Wall did fall down and it did seem like the Cold War had come to an end. Um, and then just no one, no one talked about nuclear weapons anymore. Um, but it was in 2006 that I realized that this was still a problem. And I thought, Do you know what, I'm going to find out more about this. And I became... I targeted my humanist activism specifically towards the fields of uh, of nuclear weapons, eradicating nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. And um, that became a big part of my life until, well, until, you know, the end of the end of last year. And since then, I've, um, I've taken a back seat from from nuclear weapon topics specifically, uh, moving more into presenter pr educational activities. Um, maybe we'll come on to that a bit later, but um, but that's a little bit about my my story. So yeah, so but you have been part of uh, Abolition 2000. You have been part of who has been part of yes. ICANN. I mean, you you have been very very involved with with the with that movement. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, as part of part of my activity, I became. Um, you know, I was the secretary for the Abolition 2000 uh, Global Network to abolish, nu abolish nuclear weapons. Um, I wrote a documentary film with with our colleague Alvaro Oras um, called "The Beginning of the End of Nuclear the Weapons," nuclear which weapons. is which is the story of the, the the nuclear weapon ban treaty, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and uh, ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, who were uh, one of the major factors in in pushing to make that happen, and they received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017, and so our documentary um, talked about uh, uh, about all of that. So I've been really very closely involved at all levels of um, nuclear activism uh, ever since uh, 2006. So based on that, you did uh, based on this experience and on this process, you did an article uh, last week. Um, um, calling on, um, on, we must stop the war, the march toward World War Three now. And and on this article, you um, you, you describe a little bit the problem of, of the moment of the two side issue fighting one another. Uh, so maybe you can start by describing that aspect quickly, uh, yeah. because it's a little bit boring, but. It's, uh, it's not growing yeah. as on the article, but it's a, it's, it's a sad state of yeah. affair. Don't, don't. Yeah, I mean, you know, the situation is, David, that, um, you know, there are lots of similarities with the, the, the 1930s at the moment in terms of the rhetoric, the way that people talk about immigrants or anyone with any kind of difference. There's culture wars where I mean, you see... You see these incredible situations in in the United States and increasingly over here, where you know the right wing are mobilizing against any minority they can, whether that's immigrants or whether that's you know drag drag queens, um, the trans people. I mean, there is there's an incredible level of uh, of discrimination both domestically. And also internationally, so the huge amount of discrimination. Obviously, at the moment, um, the rhetoric against the Russians, but against the Iranians, against the Chinese, against you know, there was the war, the war on terror, which was no more than a war on uh, uh, on Muslims, really. Um, and that level of hatred has been building and building, and has been used by governments around the world as a tool in order to distract people from the real problems that they are facing. And the real problems that we are facing is the fact that we've got huge economic disparities, people all over the world, and increasingly in the richest countries of the world, living in living in poverty. They don't know where the money is going to come from in order to, to pay their bills. Um, and they're making decisions about whether they should pay for the electricity to heat their homes or whether they should give give food to, to their kids. And and these kind of problems of of uh, the economic situation, which is you know the attention from which is being deflected by attention being put onto problems of uh, of migrants and people who are different. This is all very similar, and we see the same kind of 
language being used um, in by governments and by their spokesperson, which is increasingly the right wing media. And one of the other problems that we, we have at the moment is that the, you know, the vast majority of the world's media are nothing more than spokespersons for the global elite. And so the information that people are, are surrounded by, um, the, the opinions that, that they are forming are, are increasingly uh, promoting the values and goals of the oligarchs and the billionaires. And it's not do, doing anything to help ordinary people. And so this this situation which we can see in history from the 1930s is being repeated now and obviously we have this situation with with the, the war in ukraine so there's a european front opening up there's an increasing belligerent attitude from the united states and by extension all of the uh, west and the, the white west is uh, as you refer to it in, in your book um, um and you know that is uh, that attitude against China is is starting to create real tension, and obviously we all know the situation um, with Iran and how much the the hawks in in the United States would like to start uh, another war, um, working in collaboration with the, with their colleagues in the Israeli government. So, so really, the the situation is is incredibly incredibly worrying and. Um, and something needs to be done about it. So yeah, this is and this is also so that's uh, the the two side story. And then you you go to the logic of uh, um, the need the need to uh, to uh, to create or to develop a new peace movement. Yeah. And and based on different value, based on the on the different type of work, based on on really um, attacking uh, uh, not just one thing, but having mm -hmm. a, a more global vision, no? You know, one of the points that I make in this article uh, is I, I make a reflection of the of the peace movement. You know, I have been, as, as I said, you know, my role in, uh, in the anti-nuclear network meant that I was very closely um, involved in many, many conversations that were happening, certainly at the beginning of the Ukraine war last year. And the peace movement was in absolute disarray because it was very difficult to come up with any kind of coherent and coordinated agreed position which reflects uh, the point of view of all of these groups because, because we have the situation where, I mean, to put it bluntly, people in different sides of the peace movement are taking different sides based on based on nation now they're saying that you know the russians are bad therefore you know, therefore we have to we have to win a war against russia and on the other hand you have the people saying you know united states nato is bad we we have to do everything that we can to to stop them from uh from, from winning the, that war and so you have these these two sides which seem to have forgotten that living through this whole process are 40 million or so ukrainians who are you know under attack mm -hmm. being slaughtered in their thousands um being displaced from their homes in their millions refugees all around uh, europe it's, it's something like 50 percent of the ukrainian population is now uh, are now refugees and and what we all know very clearly is that every conflict, every war in history eventually comes to an end because it's negotiated around a conference table. And, and instead of the peace movement saying, stop the war now, let's, let's hold peace talks, let's put everything on the table without any conditions, without any preconditions, let's put the weapons down, let's get around the table and let's talk. Yeah, that should be the conversation that we're having. And that should be the, the unified position uh, of a peace movement. But that sadly is not. And I think we are losing very much the, the, the fact that there are human beings involved in this process who are suffering every day. And that's where also the energy from the government and financing should go. Because if you keep putting money, it's like putting wood to the fire. I mean, you, yes. it, it just, uh, it, it's just going to keep going internally. Yeah, I mean, you know, the strategy from the West and the NATO um, 
in the Cold War was to kind of financially bankrupt the Soviet Union, and that that seems to have have uh, have eventually happened. Um, but now there doesn't seem to be any kind of there's no similar situation. You know, China and Russia and an increasing number of countries which are tired of the Western rhetoric are tired of these so-called, you know, rules-based order, you know, whatever that may mean that they want to impose on the world, where we have a United Nations system, we have a whole body of, uh, of international law. But every time the West doesn't like something, they, and when I say West, I generally mean the United States here as, yeah. the, as the, the, the prime mover here. But, you know, the United States has withdrawn from the from the AB, ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the Inter, Intermediate Nuclear Rain Forces Treaty. The United States pulled out of the Paris uh, Agreement, pulled out of the JCPOA Agreement, which was the best um, safeguarding uh, treaty ever created when it comes to, to nuclear weapons. And yet, whenever, you know, whenever things don't suit the the interests of the United States elite, they decide that actually international law is not really working for them. So they pull out. And so then they create this concept in their head called, you know, rules-based uh, order, which you know, no one else in... Bilateral agreement. Yeah. No one else in the world has uh, has agreed to that to that yeah. concept. The Global South hasn't agreed to it, yeah. and so you see things like the BRICS um, alignment, and there's something like 40 countries now which are applying to become part of BRICS. So you know the whole geopolitical situation, the global geopolitical situation, is changing. The axes is moving, and we, we I think we're seeing that the White West is is finally in the death throes. You know, every civilization comes to an end, and here, here it looks like something similar is happening. So you um, you see the need to to transform the system value, the value yeah. we are we are uh, having, uh, or create this pyramid or this type of uh, organized um, society. Huh. And and so can you describe it? And I think that's what could also transform the peace movement. Yes. And, and I think if we're going to have any conversations about how to move forward as, as a species, as humanity, you know, we are on the edge of a crisis, which is one accidental press of a button away from putting an end to human civilization as we know it. I mean, anyone who studied the topic of nuclear weapons will know this, but maybe there are many people uh, who, who watch face to face who aren't quite aware. But a, a study a few years ago by International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War pointed out that a limited nuclear war involving 100 bombs exchanged between two countries, you know, with those bombs targeting their big um, metropolises um, could result in enough soot being pumped into the uh, atmosphere, which would create a nuclear winter, which would put two billion human beings at risk of starvation. Now, that's one quarter of the Earth's population. Now, human civilization does not survive from that kind of uh, catastrophe certainly not in the way that, that we know it. We are, we are bombing ourselves back to, back to the Stone Age. So it's very important that, that whatever we, we do to move forward, we have to create something which is going to be universally acceptable. And, and there have been several attempts at organizing society o uh, over history. Um, we had situations where you know monarchies you know we put the king as the highest value uh or god as the highest value or the state as the highest value um yeah there were, there were those are the kind of the the, the biggest uh, ideologies and each one of them has resulted in huge pain and suffering and also a a kind of dehumanization of people who don't have the same king, who don't have the same religion, who don't have the same color of skin, you know, who, uh, who don't have the same flag. Yeah. So once you once you dehumanize people, you create the situation where you can justify all kinds of violence against them. And 
And what is required going forward is a recognition that the only way for us to survive is to find something common. And the common thing we have amongst all of us is that we're all human beings. We all share a common uh, humanity. And and we all we all want the same things basically we all want security we all want decent good health care good quality education security on our old age a dignified life we want a decent meal you know once or twice a day you know all of those things is shared that those aspirations are shared by 99.99 percent of humanity so what is required is some kind of blank piece of paper say okay what do we all agree on yeah so let's agree then that whatever we base our society on what is required is a system which is going to be sustainable what does that mean it means that we have to make this planet habitable for millions of years to come we're not talking about putting voting for proposals which are going to um deal with the next four years until the next election we need to have we need to be thinking about the future of everyone in on this planet and the generations millions of generations to come so that's the first point so what does that mean it means we have to recognize that we only have one planet and the resources that are on this planet are all we have therefore everything that we produce everything that we use we have to find a way of making it sustainable recyclable and uh, and not and not exhausting our planet's resources. That's the first thing. We also need to make sure that we put human life as the central value, not human life as in human life above all others. Human life exists on this planet in a relationship, again, a symbiotic relationship with all the other forms of life on this on this planet. Therefore, we've got to look after the planet. We've got to make sure that we don't boil it uh, boil all the oceans away. We've got to make sure that we have enough biodiversity. We've got to make sure that there are places where you know we're not pumping trillions of tons of uh, uh, of plastic into the oceans and p polluting the rivers. You know all of these things. And, I mean, it has to be, and it's common sense. It's not like it's not like it's some radical view. It's absolutely common sense that we need a planet which is sustainable for millions of years. That we also need to value human life. We can't. We can't allow human society to say, OK, well, it's OK. It's OK to to kill those people over there because they don't share our religion or uh, wave the same flag, uh, speak the same language. No, we, all of that is 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 not relevant to the um, to what we need in order to survive as a human species. So then you can go on and talk about, OK, well, in that case, if if human life is the, is the central value. Weapons become obsolete tomorrow. We don't need them. The trillion dollars which the United States is spending every year on its military budget. And Biden just put uh, one trillion just on the table last week. Yeah, you know, that one trillion dollars. And, you know, if we add all of the world's military budgets together, we probably come to two trillion. But so let, and let's not forget that, you know, the United States uh, spends as much as nearly all the other countries of the world put, put together. Yeah. You know, so you take to take two trillion dollars and imagine what you could do. Because what is what is money? Money is basically uh, a tool for exchanging goods and services and time. Yeah. If you put one trillion dollars worth of human activity into educating people, feeding people, caring for people. Um, promote developing science uh you know there is so much that that we can do as a society which will benefit everyone in in, in the planet instead of you know so dedicating that money to to weapons so you know if we get rid of the, the weapons then that means imagine what we can do to healthcare imagine the diseases that we can um eradicate imagine imagine the quality of life that we can we can create not just for the wealthy white West, but for everyone in the planet. I mean, it's all total, totally doable, but we need to we need to base it on a, on a different set of values. So as that percolates down, then what we come to is the fact that, you know, one of the, the problem is violence. And what is violence? You know, violence is 
are creating pain and suffering in human beings. It's not just the physical act of punching someone or starting a war. It's also the economic violence, the psychological violence, the sexual violence, you know, the moral violence. All these different ways that human beings have invented are to make other human beings feel bad and to suffer. You know, all of that has to be to be tackled. So, you know, if if it were possible for a call to be made in which we could say, right, we need to start again. We need to think about what is our long-term goal? Where do we want to be in 10 years, in 50 years, in 5,000 years, in 5 million years? And that's the roadmap that we have to make. And we're in a situation at the moment. We don't have to we don't have to tear everything up and throw it all away. We have to work out what is the what is the roadmap to get from where we are today, leveling everyone up to the situation of a dignified life, reducing the, the spending uh, on, the, on the military, on weapons, creating a situation in which we are allowing the planet to recover. We're sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We're allowing the bio, biodiversity to reestablish itself. Yeah, all of this can be done. I mean, in terms of climate change and, and biodiversity, this is very urgent and, and very much needed. But if we stop military activity tomorrow, we're already making a, a, a huge uh, step forward because, you know, I think it's the, the emissions, the carbon dioxide emissions. We don't even know what are the carbon yeah, dioxide 20, emissions. 20 percent, 20 percent. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a huge amount. Already yeah, by yeah. that, you know, you make a, an enormous step yeah, yeah. You towards get to the 1.5 you need. Yeah, exactly. You know, everything is possible. Well, what is required is for people to develop this this new uh, consciousness or uh, which is based around the value of human life and not based on the value of my flag my national anthem my religion my side the, the monarch <laughs> that happens <laughs> to be my you know, side. Yeah. in in, in in control of or living in a country where I didn't choose to be born, I just accidentally was born here. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. that's kind of I think what is what uh, certainly what my article was calling for. All right, thank you so much, Tony. Any anything you want to add? Um, and before you we wrap up, any call? Any? Well, you know, um, an, a group called called Europe for Peace, which um, which has been active. Uh, well, actually, ever since in, from the Czech Republic, ever since the days uh, when uh, Obama proposed to put a, uh, a, a radar base there, uh, as kind of this kind of um, missile defense system, uh, the, 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 the guys in the, in the Czech Republic have started to act again. Um, and the, the Europe for Peace, if you look for it online, you can see that they're organizing a call for Sunday, the 2nd of April to see how many people they can get to just do one activity in the name of peace, whether that's putting a flag outside their window, whether it's going to a protest, whether it's, you know, working with your uh, your religious community, praying for peace, whatever that may be, you know, just doing something and, and trying to, to wake people up to the fact that there is a new consciousness that, that is, that is required. And I mean, I mean, it's a first step. It's a first step, but something has to be done because we can see that we are really, really in a dangerous situation. And a war which is already with Russia, if it ends up taking on China uh, and Iran and, and others, I mean, it, it, it's the end of civilization as we know it. And that would be very sad. All right. So April 2nd, thank you very much. And hashtag Europe for peace. Hashtag Europe for peace. That was your show face to face and keep being watching your news on presenza.com and we hope to see you very soon. Thank you.